Hey, we're here on the On.NET show I'm with Ryan and Glenn. We're going to talk about the microservice templates in .NET Core 3.0. Come check it out. All right, welcome guys. Welcome, Hi. Shane. All right, um, microservice templates in .NET Core 3.0. Yeah. What are they? And how are they different from what I'm used to doing in file new project, give me a web API template? Right. So they are good news. They're mostly the same. <laughs> Thank you. So there's one new one, which we, uh, which we called Worker. And so, because when we talk about microservices templates as a set, well, an API, the same API template or the same MVC template or the same Razor Pages template that you've used forever are still part of kind of a big microservices solution, potentially, right? Uh, what we added is we started to look at kind of the types of you know, architectures that people would be building, big microservice architecture diagrams, look at the pictures people have got on their whiteboards and on the walls, and we said, okay, well, for each of those boxes you have on that, on that wall there, what template would we use? What would we, what would we tell people to go do to build that type of application? And one of the things that was missing was the type of, like a Windows service, if you, from the, from, the, from uh, or a system D daemon, or a container running along just a job that goes for a long time without necessarily HTTP. Okay. So the new template, the worker template, is the same uh, patterns, the same code patterns in your program CS, the same extensions configuration, dog logging, dependency injection, lifetime, all of those things that are familiar and make you like ASP.NET Core and the web templates but without a web server and without a HTTP stack, health checks, all these sorts of things. So what that means is now you can go create a worker template, run a command, and it's running as a Windows service. You can F5 it, and it's running like a console app, to run it as a Windows service, run it as a systemd daemon, put it into a Docker container, run it on Kubernetes, you, any, anywhere you want, right? And you then, up to you what you want to do. People do like log shipping or talking to a message queue or lots and lots of things where you have background services that are not APIs or don't need an API. Um, we found a lot of people today were running an ASP.NET Core API and they didn't really have necessarily any APIs. Um, eShop on containers, our microservice um, like reference architecture that um, Cesar de la Torre has been working on, it has these. It has things that are purely kind of message queue processes and because they wanted to build on the host builder and they wanted DI and they wanted config and they wanted logging, they just said, okay, it's fine if it's got a web server, we don't care. And they used ASP.NET Core for that and so they removed things. Let me let me stop you because you introduced a new term. Mm. You, you said worker template. I did. So uh, I'm going to guess that a worker template is something that's not have a uh, an endpoint that I can hit. Yes. Right? So you want to... Maybe you could, define you could, it better. You could think of a worker as like, like a production console app, right? Okay. So you've yeah, got sure. logging support that you're probably familiar with already. Mm -hmm. You've got configuration support built into the box. You've got our DI system uh, sort of baked into the model or another DI container if you want. Mm -hmm. But it's just got this like start-stop pattern. Mm -hmm. So anything that's a service that's going to run for a long time or yep. even in some cases if you want to have a short job that's going to wake up and process a few things and then kind of go back to sleep, mm -hmm. It's appropriate for all these like cloud native console apps if you think about it that way. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, like uh, worker jobs. Exactly. Okay. Like uh, yeah, like the uh, like like we did with web jobs. Web jobs. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Um, now, when we're talking about microservice templates, um, there's a couple of things that uh, have been introduced that uh, come around the microservices and and uh, you know testing the Swagger uh, implementations that have been in the past, and how are those coming forward in these 3.0 templates? Right. Uh, we started in 2.1 and 2.2, as you said, on this, on, and the, uh, with a goal of making, building APIs that use OpenAPI, use Swagger better. So the start of that, which we still haven't actually achieved yet in 3.0, though we will, we hope to by the end of 3.0, is when creating a project, you want to be able to say, I want to use Swagger, and these are the libraries that I'm going to use, the Swashbuckle and Swag. Um, and then we provide analyzers, Visual Studio tooling, to say, when, to say that your code matches your document, and then code fixes to 
fix it when that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, the example here might be you know, you're returning a you know, a, a status code that the document doesn't doesn't say that you're going to return, and then you will get a squiggly saying, "Hey, your document doesn't say that you're returning the status code." You might want to like make sure that your document does, so that people know that you could return the status code. Um, and then we also have conventions that we baked in to say, like, you know, by default, if you sh if the shape of your API is kind of a normal get by ID type, then you probably have these status codes, and you get those kind of for free, and then you can customize them as you see fit. And then, so the 3.0 work is extending that further. Firstly, as I said, to get it so you can create the ad swagger at the beginning. But then also to say, well, what if then I, when I want to talk to that API, how do I get a client to talk to it? And so what we intend to do is work with um, NSWAG, open source um, project from the community, and Autorest. And we, what we want to do is build a bunch of glue. Uh, MS build and code that is knows how to get a Swagger document out of a project um, when you don't just have one on disk if you're not doing document first that's sort of then uh, and then can generate a C sharp client to talk to that and we want to make it as close to possible as just a project to project reference so you go like client has a one line of MS build that says I refer to this other project, and we do the work of going and getting the document, generating a client for you, and then every time you change, you get a build, and you see the changes, and you call a method. Uh, make it very much like that right-click add client reference that you've seen before in other t in, in some of our other other technology stacks. Um, and also very similar to what you might expect in a gRPC kind of world, where it's very document first all the time, yeah. uh, and you always generate clients. Um, we see a lot of um, similarities between people who are choosing to use Swagger and some of the ways people use gRPC proto files. Okay. Uh, it's funny you bring up gRPC. Um, I've talked to uh, some of our friends in the community mm -hmm. who, who've looked at 3.0, looked at gRPC, and are starting to question, like, how, what's our support like for, for gRPC? You know, yeah. They are, you know, hand, hand coding their proto files mm -hmm. and saying, you know, where does this fit? How do I make the choices? Um, so what does our tooling look like? And, and, and I know we're, we're committing uh, code to the gRPC project. Yeah. So yeah. what does that story look like for us moving forward? So, we're, so, so there, is a, there is an existing supported or available uh, gRPC client that's part of the gRPC uh, project as well mm -hmm. as gRPC server for .NET. So you know, at any point, if at any point you, want to do our, you wanted to do gRPC on .NET, you already have some options there. We're partnering with um, some of the people at Google who work on gRPC and with the gRPC Foundation to try and just make things a little bit better and a little bit more integrated with ASP.NET. Great. So some of the things that we're doing is we're directly integrating with routing, um, other kinds of ASP.NET systems. It's gonna feel kind of like using MVC or using one of our frameworks. Uh, and then the other aspect of that, which you brought up, is tooling. Mm -hmm. So we're doing work right now to put the uh, gRPC sort of like IntelliSense package in Visual Studio. So Visual Studio is going to go out with IntelliSense and some completion for proto files in it. So it'll hopefully be a little bit more convenient to edit the proto files. Yeah. And then we're going to try and deliver the same experience uh, like Glenn talked about with Swagger for gRPC. So you can update your proto file and see your client update or you can update your proto file and see your server update, things like that. So another, another pattern that's pretty common in gRPC that's maybe a little bit less common with Swagger Open API is to generate your server code as well, mm. or generate sort of stubs for your server code. So we're gonna try and make that feel as automatic as we can through tooling where it's a, it's a, a tight inner loop and a very interactive experience. So it should feel like MVC, like you said, so I should be able to say services.addgrpc look at all of my decorations of my methods and I've got my proto files and it should feel like anything else that I'm using from, from my middleware and everything else. Yeah, that's the goal, yeah. yeah. It should feel like we built it and it's all coherent and cool. it fits together. That's yeah. great. One last thing on the tooling. I know that, I want to say it was last build, we showed off a really cool command line, test my HTTP endpoint. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you showed it off. I did. And I was very excited about it because uh -huh. I like command line tools. Yep. Where, where are we at with that? Is that going to ship? So, or? Unfortunate, so this Not is maybe fortunate or unfortunate <laughs> depending upon your point of view. Okay. Um, I had the idea for that tooling and I kind of had people agree that yeah, we should build this. We've got a lot of people excited. We, we built it and found a bug. A bug that meant that that particular console app was unusable on Linux. Okay. And we decided, or I decided, the appropriate thing to do was not ship it. Mm. Because 
I wasn't willing to ship a utility from us that didn't work across all the OSs that was subpar on Mac and Linux, basically. Okay. Um, it was like you would type a character and you would wait a few seconds and then you would see the character appear on the console. It was atrocious. Um, so we fixed all of that now um, and we hope to be shipping it still soon. Um, yeah, okay. and as part of that, we moved it into the tooling team where it belongs, like with the, all the, the people who be devs who build all the other tools. I'm sure it's open source too, and we can get yeah. some help yeah. if we need to speed it up. That'll be the goal. I think we know a couple of people in the We open know source. a few people on the <laughs> work on open source software around here. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, another caution that comes up often with our, uh, with our APIs is um, security mm -hmm. and uh, identity. Um, I think we're just partnering with um, Identity Server, is that right? Is that yeah. still the story? Yeah, that's right. Um, Barry Dorans on our team um, and Javier, one of our devs. The goal here is Identity Server already has a solution in this space. They're really popular. Um, go to a conference where one of the guys is talking about Identity Server and a room is packed, right? Like yeah, it's sure. popular, people love it. Um, what we're trying just to do is just integrate with that and just make it easier. Right. If you're .NET on both sides and you've got a client just talking to an API, let's try and make those sorts of flows really easy and then just work for, extend from there. Just ease of use, ease of use tooling, all those sorts of things, the value that we can help, help try and provide by making it easy. Making Are it we easy building as we any of, of that stuff into our templates? Or I believe, we can extend the template still, right? The .NET template yeah. Yeah. capabilities. Right? Yeah. I believe the goal here is that when you're making an API template, you should be able to choose that um, I want to do auth like with a spa on okay. this API so and, it'll, and it'll all kind of work, yeah. Okay. Um, now, we've talked about uh, gRPC, we've mm -hmm. talked about uh, obviously our standard HTTP2 um, capabilities that we have. Um, how do I choose? Um, we, we have a lot of customers that are in, in the enterprise. They've bet on WCF in the past. Uh, they've moved to Web API 2. And uh, is there a transition for them? How do they how do they choose going forward? Do we have some guidance either in the works or now? Right. So there's no need to transition from like a web API to a gRPC or okay. anything like that. Um, do you want to talk about sure. gRPC versus web API sure. in terms of if you're building a new thing? So if you're building a new thing and you're trying to think about how to understand some of the differences between like a, a REST API and gRPC, uh, how you might think about it is that they're kind of different approaches and they're different, uh, different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, or doing different ways of doing different things. Some people would even say, if you're a, a real like REST person who believes strongly in that philosophy, you would hear a term like gRPC and say, well, that's, G that's RPC, that's not REST. They're okay. not the same thing, right? So how I sort of think about it personally is like, well, gRPC is a simplified and perhaps more prescriptive model for how to write what is essentially an HTTP API. Mm -hmm. Um, so gRPC, in gRPC, things are like method calls. You call a method and you pass the parameters. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit of a simpler model with less stuff to design and fewer choices to make. Uh, gRPC is also contract first in a really strong way, like WCF is, meaning okay. that you, you design your services, you design what methods they support, you design what the parameters are, all your data types, and you don't write those with code. Usually you write those in a, a sort of description language or a proto file and then those get generated into code. Um, so reasons you might choose one or the other. Um, you might choose REST if you're familiar with it and you like it. It's not, not wrong, it's not mm -hmm. going away. It's still a, still a cornerstone of our offering. It's sure. still a cornerstone of the microservices you know, story worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, you, might choose, uh, you might choose REST if your goal is to interoperate with literally everybody yep. because you know, REST as an internet solution for making an API that anybody can call. Yep. That's a known that's a known uh, known tech that everybody already likes. Sure. Yeah. Um, you might choose gRPC inside your own network if you want something fast, mm -hmm. um, if you want something simple, if you want something that you can sort of evolve um, quickly, or um, or sort of keep that keep that contract like between, between in, within your organization or between a couple teams. So if you have a, a mindset around like WCF has that contract based development, yeah. gRPC might make that sense to, if you have yeah, that mind, that development mindset that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it might just appeal. I mean, if you liked WCF, it might just appeal to you. Yeah, I always yeah. tell people that 
try them both, whatever makes sense to you or your development team, go with, yeah. go with that. We've said this a few times, like nuance, I've said this to Ryan many, many times lately, <laughs> that uh, nuance guidance is really hard. Really hard. There's a lot of nuance in where one might be better than the other. Mm -hmm. um, we'll try and do our best to provide some documentation and guidance, but as um, Hanselman used to say when we were beginning .NET Core, like, Choice, more choices is good. Sure. Give you the right choices that you know don't have two things the same, but having more choices is generally good. And our general security guidances are about the same as well when it comes around yep. the endpoints, SSL all the way through. Yeah, yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, that's the same. Yeah, they're far, they're 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 similar but different. And they, some people were going to love one and uh, not like the other as much. Some people will not care either way, and that's all fine. Yeah. Uh, anything else around the templates, tooling? You guys think is important for us to know? Uh, um, let's see. Hmm. I don't know. I think that's probably we covered. We hit, hit a lot of the yeah. boxes in that in that in that space. Um, all going to be available in 2019. Visual Studio 2019. Yeah, that's right. All, okay. all aim for that. You can try out a lot of all pretty much everything we've yeah. talked about now. You could try it right now. Okay. Um, you go grab the grab the latest of everything Thanks. and do file new, and you'll see a bunch of stuff that you might not have seen before if you haven't tried before uh, before the 3.0 wave. Cool. People have yeah. questions. Where can they reach you guys? They could talk to us on GitHub. GitHub's the best place. Yeah, GitHub's the best place. Or okay. well, they could just tell me how amazing I am on Twitter if, they, yeah. if they'd like to do that. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, thanks for being here and uh, giving us the bits on the microservice templates. And uh, we will talk to you next time on the Omni.net Show. Thanks, thanks for inviting us. Thanks.